Welcome back to The Ethical Entrepreneur, where I chat to 21 experts in ethical and sustainable business over 21 days. I hope your list of tips and tricks is filling up by now. I'm Marika Timmers, and I have been delighted to be on this ethical journey with you, learning as we go. I'm even more delighted today to introduce you to Bill Kermode, who is Chairman and CEO of Next Foundation, a strategic philanthropic fund with $100 million spent down over 10 years. Next invests in environmental and education initiatives that make Aotearoa New Zealand a, place, a better place for its land and its people. Bill has been with Next since its, its launch in 2014, and for the previous two decades, he was founding director of Direct Capital, New Zealand's most experienced private company investor. Until last year, Bill was director of the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, offering global social change makers a path to New Zealand citizenship through New Zealand's new global impact visas. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, Marika. Nice to be here. So Next administers a 10-year, $100 million program of strategic philanthropy. What is strategic philanthropy and why is it needed in today's society? Yeah, well, you're right, Marika, to stumble over that word. It's not a great word. <laughs> yeah, it's a tricky it one. With a whole lot of connotations uh, that are typically about sort of old people doing things to help young people at the end of their careers. And so uh, that's sort of uh, the way, the way a lot of people think about philanthropy. It's not the way we think about it, but it is... Um, it is a word which, if uh, anybody has uh, a better suggestion uh, than that, we'd, we'd happily uh, listen to it. But look, strategic and strategic philanthropy is probably even worse as praise. But it, uh, it means uh, for us, you know, what we mean by strategic philanthropy really is, uh, is about funding organisations and people that, uh, that create, measure and grow impact in the system that they are in. So, you know, then the question is, well, what is impact really? Because it can mean a whole lot of different things to different people. And, and so in our perspective, impact is sort of positive and sustained change in the system that somebody's acting in. And, um, and as you said, you know, from Next's point of view, you know, what we would love to see is that strategic philanthropy helping to make Aotearoa New Zealand a better place to live in, you know, for our and, and for a longer term for our children and, and for their grandchildren, really. And mm -hmm. um, so, so for us, that's, uh, that's what strategic uh, philanthropy is about. It's, um, you know, why is it, why is it needed? Well, um, or why has it got a place, really? Because, uh, you know, I wouldn't uh, you know, uh, say that it's needed, but I do think it's got a place in terms of making a contribution to that better uh, to a better world. And, and um, if you think about system change and things happening at a system level, then, you know, government is an obvious driver for system change in countries and, and thinking about things at a national level other, and other organisations, be they business or what I like to call for-purpose organisations rather than not-for-profit organisations. I prefer to use the phrase for-purpose. And, you know, for-purpose organisations or business organisations can also make big contributions to system change, but our government's the obvious driver. But uh, sitting alongside that, philanthropy can add a number of things to the toolkit, uh, if you like, that that if you just look at government, that it, that it it might not have or might not be able to bring. And so those sorts of things are things like being solution focused, um, really without, and, and having the privilege and the opportunity to be very focused in terms of the sorts of things we support and, and how we're going about, going about those things, being able to take a multi-year view. So we are involved in organizations, supporting organizations that are in projects that are, in our case, you know, as long as 20 years or so, on, and from a government's perspective, uh, you know, the and electoral, multiple governments then too. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and multiple, you know, the electoral cycle is just not that long. So, uh, uh, so 
philanthropy has got that opportunity. It's got uh, the opportunity in terms of an appetite for risk that can be different from other organizations. And while that, that varies a lot from one philanthropic organization to another, there's certainly the opportunity to be at the risk end of that, uh, of that, uh, of that uh, schedule, if, if we choose. And, and it's got the benefit of being you know, perceived and I think perceived correctly as being an honest broker in terms of its its position at the table. And um, and so by having that sort of position at the table and in, in, in discussions that involve multiple parties, it can really uh, it can really make a difference. So no no one organization, no one sector is the whole answer to any of these things, but I do believe that strategic philanthropy can sort of be a powerful catalyst and a supporter for change um, in, a, in a wider space. Yeah, so you mentioned the, the time frame, you know, and, and in the grand scheme of things and in this, you know, given the scale of, of some of the, the challenges we have, whilst you can make a huge impact in just 10 years, it's likely that not all of those complex problems are going to be solved in that time. So, like you certain, said, you've certain, said, certain, probably. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you already mentioned the role of, of government, um, but you have, there are obviously other partners in there as well and, and aligning yourselves with the right organisations, the right communities, as well as the government um, to continue to deliver long after that fund is gone. How do, how do you do that? And, and what tips can you give to others also looking to develop partnerships? Yeah, well, look, look us, uh, us being set up as a 10-year spend down. Um, and so, you know, uh, so the two elements of that are obviously a fixed life in terms of the giving that we're, that we're doing, like the commitments to giving that we're doing. Um, uh, and, and the spend down is actually is about giving away the capital, not just the income from the capital over that period of time. So our perspective in terms of that is not because we thought that we were going at, wanted to go at things that could be, that could be solved in 10 years. So your point, and, and in some of the things we're in, as I say, some of the environmental projects, you know, they've got much, much longer timeframes. And um, so our perspective on that, and I guess why the trustees set, set up that model was in part, one of the drivers was actually saying, there are issues that need to be addressed today, not tomorrow or not 30 years down the track. And uh, if we've got the opportunity or we want to make a contribution, then we should be getting on with it and doing it now. And, um, and, uh, and so uh, that, that's sort of one of the drivers behind uh, the fixed life. The other, the other uh, an, or another driver behind it is to say that if you don't think that you can make a difference to something in 10 years, uh, then um, uh, you know, you're probably not focused enough in, the, in, in terms of what you're doing. Um, and it has the... The, the great advantage, I think, from our point of view of, of driving focus for us because we have to have that focus both in terms of what we're doing and in terms of the organisations that we are supporting. And, uh, and, um, and that also uh, has a really big advantage, in my point of view, of, of enabling us to have conversations with those organizations that we support about how during the time that we are supporting them, that we're able to take them to a better place without us, post us leaving. So that conversation about what's the sustainable model here, both financial and in other respects, if, if it's needed, um, is one that we're able to have with organizations from day one uh, because they know and we know that we're only here for a short period of time and um, and they know and we know that we want them to be in a better place when we're gone than they are when we're with them. Uh, and so um, uh, that is, um, you know, those are, those are good drivers for us, I think. We have to, you know, in terms of, in terms of thinking about how we get there, we ran on open processes in terms of as a way to start off in terms of understanding some of the areas we were going we did what we call ecosystem maps in terms of the areas that we're in 
And then we start looking for leaders and what we call acupuncture points to make a difference because $100 million is a massive amount of money for a family to gift to um, anything to a country in some ways. But if you think about issues that like the environment or issues within the education sector, um, you know, vote education and is, um, is uh, of the order of uh, $11 billion a year. And uh, so hundred you be under no illusions that $100 million over 10 years divided by two uh, is not um, going to change this. So we cut out there, Bill, um, but let's go back to what you were saying about how you, how you find and, and work with other organizations. Yeah, sorry about that, Marika. So the um, look the uh, um, yeah in in terms of um, in finding organisations or finding a way to make a difference, I guess what we did go we went out and uh, and ran a ran an, an an expression of interest process to give us a look at a wide range of organisations that so that so that we could understand what was happening in the sort of ecosystem that we were interested in. Uh, in supporting in some way. We did what we called an ecosystem mapping process. We looked for what we called acupuncture points in the system being sort of small points that uh, were small but highly leveraged points in terms of make, being able to make a difference. And we looked for leaders to support that were operating in those spaces. And, and then our modus operandi is really about trying to support examples of best practice in that space. So organizations that are showing that things can be done to contribute towards making a change in that uh, ecosystem and, and helping them set up mechanisms for that change to be sustainable um, and, and go on. So, that's the way we think about our, the contribution we can make um, to that change, given we've got a short time to do it and there's some big challenges. Yeah, so given that short period of time, obviously that focus and that urgency around delivering results is really important. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And so measuring is, um, you know, measurements are uh, a key part of that. And measurement in areas... Uh, in, in areas like um, a number of ed educational issues or in areas like water and the environment are d difficult things to do. Uh, um, one, of the, one of the reasons we're engaged in an area like a predator-free New Zealand and one of the reasons why we do think there can be, there's been real progress made nationally over the last you know, five and 10 years is that there are pretty, there are good and easily understood measures of progress so that, so that funders, organizations, government can get feedback, uh, um, measurable feedback uh, about progressing in the right direction. Um, yeah. And that's one of the challenges in the social sector and the environmental sector is how you get those measures. Yeah. Yeah. So traditionally, um, you know, if we're talking long-term versus short-term, so many organizations these days have a three to five year plan, right? So um, we're all about agility um, and, and building that, that agility into our businesses so that we can be urgent and focused and, and deliver. But a lot of those um, deliverables end up being quite tactical because they're so short-term. With so many of the issues we're facing being intergenerational, is this short-term view serving us as organisations? Yeah, well, um, it's got some strengths, but um, but uh, to a to um, to drive sort of large-scale change, I think you have to have a longer-term view, and and. Um, uh, because the sorts of changes in the social sector or the environmental sector, you know, they, they're not things that can be can be achieved in three to five years, and uh, you've got to be realistic about that. Even and that's not true. That's even more true if we're talking about a single organisation, but it's equally true if we're talking about multiple organisations working together. Uh, so I guess the way we sort of think about something like that is that 
you know, a longer, a long-term time frame for um, for an ambition, if you like, or in, a, in our in our mind, there's sort of something like a 30-year view. So, what, to, to have an amb, a 30-year ambition, and I won't call it a goal because I think because things like uh, the uh, you know Aotearoa New Zealand being predator free by 2050 is coincidentally but happily you know about a 30 year ambition and mm -hmm. um, and I think that that sort of feels right uh, in terms of something that's achievable in a generation but um, uh, but but a, but a big prize. Um, and one of the things, my previous life, I was involved in private companies and private company ownership. And uh, and one of the things I really liked about working with private company owners is a lot of them have got a 30-year sort of view of the world. Right. Um, uh, and maybe it's driven, maybe that's a, a, the, that's because that's the sort of time frame they're working in or their children are working in. But I really enjoyed the fact that actually they brought that perspective to their day-to-day -day activity as opposed to a quarterly or a three-year perspective. Um, so I think having a big ambition at 30 years is a thing. But I then think, you know, you've got to be within that, you know, having a, a clear goal and predator-free 2050 is an example of that, predator-free by 2050 for a country. But then within that, a ten-year having a, a ten-year big goal is um, is something that provides another uh, another um, milestone or, or anchoring point, I think. And and in our context, in that predator-free space, for example, that's something like six to eight sort of anchor, large landscape scale projects that are that sort of can provide a bit of an anchor for um, or a bit of a backbone for. Uh, for the country in terms of um, achieving that big 30-year ambition, really. But then you go down to, um, you know, having a 10-year plan's too long and having a five, and, 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 and if you go to plan a plan where actually we're going to do this and we're going to achieve this and, and we've got a level of confidence, you know, my experience, about an 18-month time frame is a good time frame. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's the sort of time frame that you can have confidence that you can actually get get to stuff that can get done, um, and and maybe the world won't have changed so much that actually it's not going to be uh, different. So, in our world, sort of that thirty year, ten year, eighteen month time frames are the sorts of time frames that we uh, think about, and. You know, none of those things are fixed, obviously, and 18 months can be, in some cases, it's more sense for that to be 24 months, and in some cases, it's more sense for it to be 12. But as a, as a framework, I think those are the sort of timeframes we, we think about. Yeah, right. And, and by design, I guess that 30-year goal setting that um, for a business could also be what is their purpose? What are they going to solve in, in that period of time, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very much. And 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 look and that's another way to describe, you know, what I what I call 30 year ambition. It's, you know, what the what's what's the purpose in being here? And yeah. um, what's the purpose we're serving? So yeah. absolutely. And so once we achieve that, is is that what builds legacy? What does what does legacy building mean to you? Uh, I think that's one way, but happily, um, I don't think you have to wait thirty years to build uh, to build legacy. Um, uh, and um, uh, and within you know that thirty year purpose or ambition, there are, there are a whole lot of. Um, if you like legacies, big and small, that can be, uh, you know, bigger, bigger and smaller, uh, that can be created. Um, and you know, legacy is one of those words, but like impact, that can mean whatever you want it to mean, really. And everybody's got a different definition. But but for us, you know, legacy is um, is sort of in in our world, it's sort of sustained, measurable change in the ecosystem or the system or part of a system. Uh, or, or thing, uh, for example, that is um, uh, that is going on. So those legacies can be created in short, in in much much shorter timeframes than thirty years, um, 
in one way. And, you know, I, you know, for examples, you know, I, do, I use an example out of the philanthropic world uh, of that, which is not us, Tyndall Foundation, um, you know, which is a fantastic philanthropic organization in New Zealand, and made a decision a number of years ago that they wanted to see more community-based philanthropy around the country. And they started leading and have, have underpinned national setting up of community foundations in, in communities, provinces, regions around the country. And there are now, um, uh, John McCarthy will, will scold me for not knowing what the number is, but I'm going to say it's 15 or 18 community foundations around the country. And, uh, and that, you know, that's a legacy, that's a fantastic legacy. Right. And, um, yeah. but each, uh, you know, each one of those organizations is actually created a legacy in itself. So, um, so, you know, and, and for one of the, ones that, that's sort of a thing that we're involved in is an island in the in the Hauraki Gulf near Auckland called Rotorua Island, which which is which we supported and contributed to becoming a conservation sanctuary, and it is now a, a conservation sanctuary. So that's a thing that you know there's been a legacy created there in terms of that island and in terms of the example that's been created. So. There are, there are, there, there's lots of different ways to do it, um, 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 but uh, but it, but they're all about in our in our mind sort of sustained measurable change in a system. Right, and, and I love that we don't have to wait thirty years to actually <laughs> feel like we've achieved that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if and you the, can hear my legacy in the background, but. Yeah, we're recording yeah, well, that going on and, and that's the reality of having a one-year-old at home while you don't <laughs> Well, you know, and the one, one thing about having a one-year-old at home is that sort of a thirty-year time frame <laughs> sort of has some has some relevance for you in terms of you know, but you're not going to wait thirty years to, for them to for them to uh, for no, you that's to, right. to work out what they're going to do. Um, exactly. So there's there's and. And to be and to be honest, given that um, you know one of the areas we're really interested in in the education space, so I'll have a little spiel is the first thousand days of life, and the, and what yeah. you know, eighty five percent of our brain development happens in those first three years of life, and so they are critical building years. So there are um, legacies yeah. being created in your one year old, whether you're um, aware of it or not. I know you are, but uh, yeah, absolutely. And you know, and just the legacy of focusing on those, helping with th those first thousand days, the legacy that mm. that creates for for future generations. Yeah, 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 that's exactly right. I mean, it's they're the they're the foundational building blocks for life that, that the brain development that's going on at that age and stage yeah yeah it's a beautiful stage so we've got time for one they're all, they're all beautiful stages Marie. <laughs> good to know good to know <laughs> one final question for you bill um prior prior to next foundation we're getting louder you were director of a number of private companies um so given all of that experience for the audience here that are new to business um, or looking to improve their existing business, if you were in their position, what would be the top three things you would prioritize? Yeah, well, um, well, let, let me answer that in a, um, uh, you know, in, in terms of how we think about the, or the organizations that we support. Um, in philanthropy, because we're looking to support organizations that we think are operating in a business-like way. Mm -hmm. And the way we think about those, the, 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 about how to choose those organizations is really driven out of my 20 years in the private company investment space, really. Mm -hmm. uh, so while they're for purpose rather than for profit, it's the same principles. And That's so right. we've got five five points that I guess we sit and think about in terms of when we're supporting organizations that I think is one way to answer your, answer your question. And, uh, and those, you know, those five are that they've got, that they've got clarity around what their need is that they're addressing and they can quantify it and, 
uh, in some way and um, put some measures around it. So that's the same thing in many ways as your 30 year purpose, uh, if you like, um, you know, that there's clarity of in an organization around why they're there. Um, uh, and saying we're here for profit is not the answer. Uh, um, so, um, uh, so our first one is, is sort of having a clear need. Our second one is around having having um, a plan, or if you like, a a, a plan around how they're going to do that. Um, so, you know, that can be called a business plan or a strategic plan or whatever. But, um, uh, but. It, it's maybe, and so it's maybe it's obvious, but sort of having passion about it's not enough. Uh, you need to, you need a need a plan to how to get to it. So the third, the, that's the second thing for us. The third thing for us is around leadership, project and project management capability. Yeah. So, you know, leaders create leaders in our world, and um, uh, and so the leadership of an organization, the way they think about leadership in an organization and project management capability, whatever the world is that they're operating in, and ours are operating often in the social space. Uh, it's still, that, that's that's our third and, and, and critical thing for us. The fourth thing for us is really around how scalable it is, or, and the, which in a commercial sense is often called growth you know what's our what's our growth path or growth mm -hmm. plan, um, and and in our world that's about impact and and how they how they'll be able to have impact and uh, I guess at an ecosystem level or how they can contribute to that, and then the fifth thing for us is around is that sustainability point that we talked about. So what's the what's the long you know what's the model that actually will give us confidence that this organization will be around not just for the next year or three years or five years but actually beyond that and yeah. um and that from a commercial point of view is a really important thing if you when we're a private company investor looking at an organization we might have the view that we're actually only going to be there for five or eight years but we're not thinking about we're not taking a five or eight year view on them. We're taking a 15 or 25 year view because we want to contribute to making something that's, that's more investable uh, in yeah. the future, not, yeah. not just investable for that period. So my, my answer to your question about three points is five points. So. Got it. Got it. So anyone starting in business um, or reevaluating where they are today, um, those five things I had was obviously one purpose, two plan, three sounds like leadership and delivery. So being able to de deliver yep. on that plan, execute that plan. Um, yep. Four impact. Yeah. And five sustainability. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Bill. I'm sure you've given our audience a lot to think about um, in terms of longer term planning and building a, um, a lasting legacy. So what, what legacy are you leaving and, and how on track are you in terms of delivering that? Mm. We, still, we still have a few interviews left, so don't worry if you're not 100% on that. Tune in again tomorrow for more great ethical business insights. I will see you then. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Mary. Well done. Thank you.